Good morning, church. We're just on the cusp of an afternoon. <laughs> it's been great to be in church together and worship and praise together. You okay? You can hear me all right, yeah? Yeah? Is it a little bit wobbly? Let me just have a look. I am green. I am green. That's good. Good, good. Well, it's great. Uh, in our worship, we heard about Chris and his new opportunities. And um, in our intercessory prayer this morning, we heard about... Um, Corringham and their, their spacious place and they've got a beautiful field and God takes us into spacious places, doesn't he? And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical place. It could be in our, our mindset and how God opens that up to us. And uh, he's certainly been doing that with our spiritual food that he's prepared for us this morning. So we're going to follow on with our um, daily readings that we've been looking through the, the New Testament. And we've been looking at 2 Corinthians this week. So we're going to focus on chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 6. So that's 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. Now that may be as clear as mud to some of us, because he starts off with letters and recommendation, he takes us through a journey, and then he ends by saying the letter kills. By that, he's talking about if we are just sticking to law without the Holy Spirit. So we'll unpack it and have a little look. But I'm sure you've all had busy weeks. And some of you may have had posts through your letterbox this week. Have you had posts at all? Yeah? Has it been a nice letter? Has it been a hospital letter? Maybe it's been a bill? We get lots of brown envelopes through our letterbox, which are from HMRC, um, because Paul's an accountant, so we get lots of those through. But I had to post something for work the other day, and I was absolutely flabbergasted. I asked for a first-class stamp, one first-class stamp, and it was £1.65. And I said, oh, I only wanted one. She went, that is the price of one. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I obviously buy them in books and batches, so obviously I'd, lot, I'd use them all up. I'm like, so if you factor in, if you want to send a letter, I love letters, but it's a dying art, isn't it, these days? And if you factor in the paper, the cost of the envelope, the cost of the stamp, and how slowly it takes for a letter to actually arrive, if it arrives, where you want it to arrive. It's like it bamboozles us, doesn't it? And our generation, we've had to learn so much about the digital age, but people are used to instant communication. They're used to texting, emails, WhatsApp, Insta, all those things, because it's progressive, isn't it? That's how we keep up with the time. And Paul here is trying to remind people who were opposing his ministry that there is a, a difference in the old covenant and the new covenant and how people um, are used by God in that. I just wonder if you like to go out to eat, like to a restaurant, to a hotel, or go on holiday, how do you decide where you're going? Do you look at Trustpilot? You know, that, that's where you get all the nice reviews. Well, usually they're nice reviews. Sometimes if they're not a good review, you're not going to go to that place, are you? And, and Trustpilot have got the, the, the sort of scoring system with the, blue, uh, the sorry, green stars. So the more green stars, the better it is. And sometimes Trustview Pilot, uh, the reviews on there help you decide if you're going to go on that holiday or go to that restaurant or not. So it helps in our decision-making process. And I'm sure at some point in our lives, 
we have asked for references for our jobs. Yeah? And we've had to provide two referees. And we have to give careful consideration who they are, aren't they? Because we want people who are going to give good feedback on us. To be honest, none of us are going to use a referee that's not going to be very kind to us, are we? <laughs> no. <laughs> and I know maybe you've also had to do references for other people when they go on to new jobs. I know I have, and it's been really difficult to put something really great in such a very small space that they give you. Or even now, these days, they don't allow you to write a commentary. You just have to tick, tick a list of questions. And I'm like, what does that tell you about the person? Yes, they're timekeeping fine. Yes, they're punctual. Yes, they're trustworthy. But what else does it tell you about them? And there's often a lot of great and good things. And you want to share that and say, these are going to be an asset to you. We're sad to leave them. But they're going to be great for you. But there's no space. So when we do that, when we do a, a reference, or we ask for a reference, what we're actually asking is for a recommendation or a commendation. And maybe some of us have letters after our name, which speaks for themselves. So perhaps if you've studied and you've been to uni, maybe you've done a master's, you've got an MA or a BA, maybe you're an MSc, Maybe you are an OBE or an MBE, and we're in the House of Royalty here. We have someone with her. I think it's an OBE. Um, no, it's an MBE. That's good. MBE. Got to get it right because it's really important. And they, they stand for something. Our society values that. There's a lot of work that's gone in to get those things. And we have our students going off to uni. We have our children going into school to do different things and going up through the education system. We have someone today here this morning that we've known from a tiny tot that starts her first day at work tomorrow after finishing an MA. And it's like, wow, uh, God is going to go with her and she is the living letter of Christ in that place where she is going. The early church had a similar practice. So when believers or Christian workers went from one church, travelled through the town and went to another church, they would take a letter with them. And it was a letter of recommendation. It was a letter of commendation almost. Uh, and it would say to the, the incoming ministers there or whatever they are, the rabbis, this person that's coming is of good standing. They're of good character. They're not troublesome. They're not a false teacher. You can ha happily accept these in your church or synagogue. And today, our current church practice of membership is similar, and it stems from that in part, because when someone is coming into membership, they provide a testimony. And we look at the testimonies, and then we think about that and pray about that, and then they become members, generally. So some schools even today, like the Church of England schools and the Catholic schools, need a letter from the minister to say that this child and this family attend church, they're of good standing, they're good families. And they need that before they will admit the child into the school. So thinking about the letters that we may or may not have to have for our, our name, maybe the references or letters of commendation we've received throughout our careers, and then our front-facing representation of our Christian character and faith, do they all align? Do they reflect the inner faith of our relationship with Jesus. Because this is what Paul was talking about. He says and talks about living letters of commendation. So what is he talking about? From the scripture we read, Paul is saying that we are the reference that we need. So every leader, whether that's within a church context, within Christian leadership or not, will face opposition at some point in their leadership. They will come across people who don't trust what they're doing or like the way that they're working. And even in church, in this early church that Paul was growing, led by God, he experienced opposition and division constantly. He had to defend his ministry and the authority under which he was sent. And he was sent under the authority of Jesus. Furthermore, Paul has given a defense of the message that he has preached and the effects 
that it's had on his life as evidence of worth. So he wasn't portraying any signs of being a false teacher, even though he's been accused of that, and that must have hurt. He asked directly those who oppose him and his ministry. It was quite sarcastic, actually, because he said, um, what reference do you want? In terms of the authenticity of the ministry and leadership I have, who do you want me to speak or act on my behalf to give that recommendation? Do you want me to leave? Do you want me to go? And then he reminds them, about those who preach and teach about Jesus are benefiting themselves, either by profit, financially, or personal promotion. And he is against that. He is against that. And Paul says, um, he reminds us that he declares the good news of Jesus with sincerity as one sent from God and who knows he will stand before God. We will all stand before God at some point in our earthly life. Yeah? When it comes to an end and we get to heaven, praise God, we will stand before God and be judged. Therefore, what Paul is asking in these these six verses is a challenge to those who oppose him and consider what they want. Do they want him to start again? Or does it sound like they're trying to be forceful? Or is Paul being too forceful? One commentator says, does it sound like we're patting ourselves on the back? and asserting our own authority. Paul is very clear. He knows the authority by which he is sent. Yet rather than boast in his position, he humbles himself because he's grasped what it means. It is by grace we are saved and by grace we serve, not by position or prestige. Paul then goes on further because he doesn't praise those who've led others to faith. He doesn't praise them about the churches that have been planted. And he doesn't praise those who are challenging his authority. He dismissed the need to bring letters of recommendation with him for ministry. Or to ever ask for a letter from human hands to authenticate what he has been doing and being called to. So a question for us to consider. Why is Paul so strong in his belief that he never needs to bring a letter to or from his church. Why would that be such a conviction for him? Well, it's because Paul is not on a human mandate. He is not serving an earthly call. So what use is earthly affirmation, primarily when they don't understand the work of God? Paul was accountable to God and his word, and he knew his faithfulness to God. He continues in his reading here in in this scripture that the cross is his commendation. The cross is our commendation, isn't it? We wouldn't be here today if we didn't understand and value the cross and what that means. The cross where Jesus died, where he bled, he took all our sins on board himself, he rose from the dead, he ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit. None of that could happen without the cross. So the cross is our commendation as well. And in the same way as we serve the word of God, we must be humble and speak Christ with sincerity, knowing that we are from God and before God in all things and all that we do. God calls us to walk with Jesus through the Holy Spirit within us and through us. And this models an authentic living letter for Jesus inside out. I shared that this morning, but I've got this macabre, I don't think it's macabre, it's just an interest, but you know when you see open surgery on TV and some are like, oh, blood and God, I don't want to look at that. I want, I wish I could see, if I had surgery, I want to see what they're doing in my body. I want to see what the inside looks like. I know what the outside looks like, but if we knew what the inside looks like, and if there's an issue, we'd, we'd know how to correct it, wouldn't we? But God has created, no, 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 she said, no, no, no. God created us so intricately and so wonderfully and beautifully made, right from a tiny embryo, you know, from an egg and a sperm, he created us. That blows my mind and how we grow and how our hearts function and our liver and our lungs and our kidneys and how it all works is fascinating. And I would love to be able to be 
sort of on the ceiling, looking down at yourself, seeing what they're doing. Um, not saying that ever will happen, but I have that interest. But God has chosen a different career for me, a different path, thank God. <laughs> I hear you saying. But we serve a king. And I'm not talking about King Charles, because yes, we do. We are servants. However, I'm talking about Jesus. So we serve King Jesus in the kingdom. We are free from the need to be affirmed or validated by the world and its standards. Instead, we must remember that we have been called to transformation into the world with a message that is not from the world, but for it. The cross is our commendation, and Christ's ascension and gifting of the Holy Spirit is our reward for the work of the kingdom. Not that we need a reward, because when God is first, and our first love, you do anything for him, don't you? So you don't need the reward, the reward. But the fruit of the Spirit produces in us good works and is the affirmation that God gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the work in our lives and through our living. Paul says to the, those who are opposing him and to the Corinthian Christians that they are a living recommendation. We are a living recommendation. Paul continues his point. And the church in Corinth's growth in faith and fruitfulness, even under opposition and division, and we will all get opposition and division, when people know we're Christians, they're watching us and they will have comments to make. Paul knows it's the only commendation he will ever need that it's from God. They are God's affirmation of his ministry because an authentic message produces authentic conversation that leads to genuine faith and trust. When I was looking at this passage, the commentators were saying that Paul is quite cheerful. And he does come across like that. If you understand the Apostle Paul and his letters and how he writes, he is quite cheerful in how he writes this letter. And he's quite cheerful in the faith and in the reality of what he's saying. If someone asks Paul how they can be sure he's the real deal and not a false prophet, he will say to them, look at these people and the work of God in their lives. Look at their testimony. Grace realized through others, how do we see ourselves with the fruit of the Spirit and the gospel of grace? How do we see ourselves through those lenses? We gather here every Sunday most of us when we can, every Sunday if we're not somewhere else. We gather together to come together as family, to worship God, to praise, to understand the word, to receive food, to be blessed, to be sent out back into the world. The ethic of the kingdom and the fruitfulness of the king is the standard by which we are given that opportunity. In verse 2 it says, You yourselves are all the endorsement you need. Your very lives are a letter anyone can read just by looking at you. So wherever you are in your week, whatever spaces and places you occupy, in your families, in your workplace, in your communities, in your voluntary placements, in, in education, people will look at you. If they know you're a Christian, they will look at you through a different lens. And you are a living letter for Jesus wherever you are found. When we truly follow Jesus and live for him within the ethics and rhythms of his kingdom, our lives will show it. There will be something different that they will challenge us on or ask, why are you reacting that way? Why are you not running around like a headless chicken? Why are you praying before this? They will ask you, they will observe, and they will be very quick. If you slip up, they will be very quick to come to you and say, ah, these Christians, ah. But then you say, by the grace of God, I'm human and we forget and God forgives us. But lives will be transformed. It will be obvious to a weary world because when we live for Jesus, there is a supernatural transformation. Along your journey to this point in your faith, there will have been others that will have guided you, will have influenced you, and you are going to be that person for others following. I know when I came to faith, my grandparents realized it and took that for themselves and became Christians. There is a transformation. Sometimes it's gradual, sometimes it's really quite dramatic, like 
stole into Paul. He was blinded on the Damascus Road. You can't get any more dramatic than that, can you? But sometimes it might be like little increments. But people will see there is a difference. There is a transformation. So then, how do we live for Jesus every day in our normal, everyday lives? Simply put, we prioritize our relationship with God first through prayer, through Bible reading, through worship, and through life in the Spirit. Then we can get on with being faithful wherever God has placed us. You see, to be a living letter is nothing fancy or complex. It's very simple. It's simply being faithful in the kingdom and its commission in the context of our normal life, deepening our love of Jesus and dependency on him, and trusting that as we move towards God, he will move towards us, he will move through us, and in us to produce the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And after all that, we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry or work about bringing people to Jesus because that's his job. And he will do whatever he needs to do in and through us to do that. We don't have to worry about that. We just need to focus on him, give him first place in our life. You see, Jesus wrote this letter, not with ink, but with God's living spirit. It's not chiseled into stone like the Ten Commandments were, but it's carved into our human lives, and we are the publisher of it. We promote that. So anyone that's ever wrote a book, you've got reams and reams of stuff, and it's published and promoted. Paul reminds us that grace is a gift of God to us, and effectual grace in our lives remains a gift of the Holy Spirit by the very presence of the Holy Spirit. It's not, so, it's not a once-only thing done. It's a continuum. So the work in all of us is not a work of earthly power, but of heaven, of God's living spirit in us. It's not written on something lifeless. None of you are lifeless. We are breathing, living human beings. And God puts his spirit in us. Paul was saying about the old covenant, it was written on tablets of stone, but the new covenant is alive and made real in our lives through the Holy Spirit. So as we walk with Jesus, he is writing the law of God and the work of God in our hearts and the world around us by grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. And that's what it means to be a living letter of the Holy Spirit, of the living God. Paul reflects back in this passage on the old prophetic scrolls. God spoke through the Old Testament prophets that he would do something new in the lives of his people for all people. Uh, Think about the words of Ezekiel in chapter 36. It says, A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Paul teaches this new covenant has come and we are living in that new covenant. We are reminded that we are living it now. You see, the need of change within us is God's work, not ours. We can change our outward appearance, can't we? We can dye our hair, we can change our clothes, we can shrink our size or enlarge our size, but we can't do what's inside. Only God can do the inside stuff. The need to change is God's work, not ours. The demand is for an inside job, and only God can work from the inside out. We cannot attain it. We can't earn it. This righteousness of God's kingdom, it's a grace that is given to us. Where does Paul's confidence, where does our confidence come from? It's about grace and sufficiency. God calls Paul. God calls every one of us. He sustains him in the ministry and bears fruit in his ministry and faithfulness. Paul's confidence is never based on his own merit. Our fruitfulness, wherever God puts us, is not based on our own merit. We are not competent in ourselves, Paul says, to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy, grace and sufficiency is from God. This is the boast of the kingdom. We are blessed to serve and do marvellous things for the Lord. 
But like all the faithful saints that have gone before us, we delight even more about giving the glory to God because that's who deserves the glory. Paul is explaining as simply as he can to the Corinthian church, to those who oppose him, and to us today through his word, that the certainty in kingdom and life and ministry comes from God and God alone. It comes through the cross and through the Holy Spirit. And it's made real in us by the Holy Spirit. So we can boast in him and live out our freedom to serve in the kingdom and to live out the beauty of Jesus rather than be under the weight of the world's pressures. How many people are in the hamster wheel doing the worldly stuff because they are pressured to keep up with a standard? We are freed from being under the weight of trying to find value by earthly standards or to be accredited by the expectations of this world. We are all ministers of the new covenant. When God calls us, when he equips us, when he gives us his gift of his spirit, we are the new ministers of this new covenant. And our sufficiency and our ministry comes only from Jesus in the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we mean when we say it comes from God. The beauty of gospel life is contrasted with life under the old covenant. When the law was given to Moses, it was chiseled on stone tablets. It was an external code to obey. And there were a lot of laws. We had the Ten Commandments, but then they were added to by different people, weren't they? So many. The new covenant of God takes the same truths and writes them on our hearts. And Paul is saying the simple gospel truth is that the old covenant and law could not help us live in the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit. So, Let's get on with living out the kingdom life as living letters being written so that others might see and know the same hope. Wherever you are found this week or last week or the week after, you are the living letter of Jesus to those people. They may never really know who Jesus is apart from his swear word. They may never even know what a Bible is. They don't really know they, have that, they haven't got that foundation. Our children in schools do not have corporate worship any longer. And they haven't had that for a long time. That's where we used to learn the hymns and the songs and the stories. If no one is telling them, they grow up into adults that don't know. And then they have children. And they, 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 they've got nothing to pass on because they don't know. But we are the living letter. We are the, the Lord's representative wherever we are. Our lives are transformed by the miracle of the gospel. We bear witness to the enduring power of Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection, his ascension, and gifting of the Spirit. We are letters that are alive. They are real. If I come and pinch you now, you'd feel it. We are alive. We're not lifeless. In a world that is longing for signs and something to hope for, let's remember that the greatest miracle is the transformation of a human heart by the gospel of grace. We are all miracles because we know and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, yes? However that came about, we are now the living letters to be passing on to another generation. And you might think, I'm old, I'm sick, but no, we have been called by God and we are the living representation of him wherever he places us. Our own lives are transformed by God and they are a miracle. And they are a witness to those that don't, ne- don't yet know God. How many of us have got family members that don't know God? And they see us, and they might mock us. But you know what? Our prayers never go unanswered. They never go unheard, should I say. Sometimes he, he withholds prayers, like Chris is saying. Sometimes you don't know, actually, are you, what are you saying? I can't hear you, can't sense it. But they never go unheard. So we've all got work in our families to do, in our communities, in our workspaces. We are the beacons of light in a fractured community, in a fractured world. We're not just the recipients of God's grace, but we are conduits of that grace. We are incarnations of grace called to share the message of love and forgiveness and redemption in the normality of our day. You don't have to be all singing or dancing. You just have to be yourself with the Holy Spirit in you. People see you, people see me, they should see Jesus. 
Yeah? A bit like a stick of rock. Cut it in half. I might need therapy because I want to look inside and I want to cut people in half. But <laughs> what I mean is, if you do that, a stick of rock usually has like Blackpool or South End through it. You cut it and you see it all through. That's what I mean. They should see Jesus all the way through us. Yeah? As we live out our faith, let us keep hold of all the sufficiency and grace that Jesus gives. He is the all-sufficient one. He will provide everything that we need. He equips us through the Holy Spirit to be ministers of this new covenant. And grace is the undeserved favor of God. We can't earn it. We can't attain it. We can't strive for it. It's just it's given. When you're given a gift, it's really rude not to accept it, isn't it? And it's really rude not to open it and use it. So when God gives us his gift of grace, he gives it to us to be open, to be used, to be demonstrated. So this is our call, collectively together, to reflect the beauty of the gospel to everyone that we meet, serving as a living invitation to explore the depths of God's love, his grace, and his glory. Let our prayer be that we will be faithful stewards of the grace we have received. God always makes a way for every believer, for those new to faith, for those who are not yet saved. We are a miracle of grace. We are a fulfilled promise of God and we are probably an answered prayer to people who have been praying for us for a long time before we even came to faith. We need to be praying for the generations coming up behind us because we need to be passing on this legacy. We need to be the living letter that doesn't have a full stop until we actually exhaust our human end on this earth. We are living letters. There is no full stop till our last breath is drawn. And then we're in heaven and we can celebrate. Who and where can you go? Where can we go this week and be the living letter for Jesus, the living representation of him? Let's pray about the spaces and the places that we're going to be in. Even if you're on the motorway and people are cutting you up, rather than, "Mm," just say, bless them, you know. Because it's frustrating when they do it, and you do get a bit cross and anxious and anxiety. You know, and and maybe if they're cutting you in the supermarket queue or they've jumped in front of you and you've all been patiently waiting, grace upon grace upon grace. Because God has that with us, and he provides that to us. May we each go and every one of us be sustained and be the beacons of love, light and hope. We're going to share together in our worship as our worship team come up. And we're going to praise God and worship him about the way. God always provides a way for us. We are never stuck. He always provides a way in the wilderness if we feel we're in a wilderness situation. He always provides us with everything we need wherever we are placed and sometimes he gives us a God interruption we had a God interruption yesterday me and Liz had a God interruption yesterday but it was a God moment and it was a treasured time and it was a privileged time God will interrupt us and we just need to hear him and we need to listen to him and we need to be obedient to him because we are the living letters of him to other people God will provide a way he will make a way where there is no way And he will give us every place we put our foot, like he did with Joshua when Moses passed. Every place we put our foot, God will give us when we give him first place in our lives. It's really quite simple to be a living letter of Jesus, to be his commendation to others. It's prayer, it's Bible reading, it's worship, and it's the fruit of the Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit. And being attentive to that. Then all the other stuff, comes into place and he might wheedle a few bits and pieces out but it will always make a way and he will always provide a way so if you're thinking my family I've been praying for years and years and my family are still not getting it they're not showing prayers never go unanswered Abraham was told he would have descendants like millions of grains of sand did he live to see that promise fulfilled no he didn't but did God promise fulfill that promise yes he did So we are the living representation. Whatever we pray for, whatever we do, wherever he sends us, and he commissions every single one of us to go out, we are that living letter. So go out, be filled, do not be disheartened. Don't forget, he's doing the work. We just have to be available and go with him. Okay? 
So let's just pray and then we'll share together in worship. Father God, I thank you for your love for each one of us that is so high, so wide, so deep, that we don't even comprehend how much you love us. We know and thank you for the commendation of the cross, that you gave your life for each and every one of us, for your Holy Spirit, that you fill us over and over again, and that you place us where you need us to be. Maybe it's just for a moment or a season or a longer time, but you place us. Help us to be attentive to you, to be listening, and to trust that you will make a way as we go into our world this week. Wherever you place us, in whatever spaces, even if we're at home most of the time, there will be God interruptions in that. Just help us to hear your word and be attentive to you. We love you, we worship you, and we praise you. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Amen.